I'm Raj Sodi. I'm applications developer for uh, ESOF at Keysight. And uh, I think a lot about device modeling and how we can make the design, make life easier for the design community and also the design modeling, device modeling community as well. Um, and I've been working for Keysight for a total of 12 years and before that uh, Skywork Solutions as a PA designer uh, for five years and numerous other jobs before that. Uh, I'll also introduce our very, we're very excited to present uh, Dr. Ujwal Radhakrishna. This is, uh, and he is, uh, he'll be joining Notre Dame University as a faculty member this fall, but he's uh, really the, the driving force behind the development of the MVSG model. Our other Honored uh, speaker here is uh, Dr. Yogesh Chauhan from IIT Kanpur, and he is uh, the driving force behind the BSIM, the Bulk CMOS BSIM work group at the Compact Model Coalition, and he's also the driving force behind the development of the ASM hemp model, and uh, so he'll be talking in detail about that as well. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to be first talking about GAN R RF devices uh, in the first segment, the technology, industry adoption, market challenges, business drivers. In the second segment, I'll talk about uh, a, kind of an overview of the RF GAN models available today. And then in the third segment, uh, Dr. Radhakrishna will be speak about his MIT virtual source GAN model. In the fourth segment, uh, Dr. Chauhan will speak about the ASM hemp model. And, and then lastly, we will demonstrate a new toolkit that's now available uh, in ICCAP. ICCAP is a device model parameter extraction program uh, with, with a new user interface. So this is the first uh, chapter, and we'll, we'll keep you posted on, on changing chapters as we go through. So you might be wondering, okay, what's the big deal about GAN? And the answer is, it's the fastest growing segment in the RF industry, right? So here we show a study by the French company Yol, and they expect the market to grow from 380 million to 1.3 billion with a 23% compound annual growth rate. Uh, so right now, we see that the market is dominated by uh, IDMs, integrated device manufacturers, and with the growth of Win Semi, TSMC, you're going to see more of a balance between the IDMs and the foundries and, and the pure play design houses. Kind of like, uh, yeah. So, so what are the contributors for this growth? You, you guys probably already know it's, it's 5G in, uh, in the backhaul and also aerospace defense for high power radar. So here we show a table of properties on various materials, and we see that GAN as a material has some excellent properties in terms of high breakdown voltage, a good insulator, and high electron mobility, and a high maximum working temperature. So these are all very desirable properties. So silicon and gallium arsenide have relatively low band gap numbers, 1.12 and 1.42. With silicon carbide, we see much higher, uh, 3.26 and 3.425. And the larger the band gap, the more energy it takes to excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. But it turns out that the, the band gap value is correlated to the critical electric field for breakdown. And so that's the electric field required to uh, pull a valence electron away from its lattice, and then it becomes a, a free agent to, to cause more destruction and, and break down in the device. So that's, that's generally a bad thing that we don't want to have happen. So as you can see, we have much higher breakdown voltage. So that, this makes it very well suited for high voltage applications. Now you might notice the intrinsic carrier concentration. For silicon, we see 9.6 billion per cubic centimeter, whereas for gallium nitride, it's, it's basically an insulator, 1.9 e to the minus 10, right? So, so where are we supposed to get the charge if it's not from the material? 
Um, well, it turns out that the, the analog to the CMOS inversion layer uh, is, is this sheet charge. And, and that for gallium nitride is this 2D electron gas. Uh, the, the sheet charge density for the 2D electron gas is about five times higher than, than for silicon. So I guess I, I would say don't worry about the fact that the intrinsic carrier concentration is not, not very high. Mobility describes how fast an electron moves in response to a low electric field, right? And the mobility for GAN is not as good as ga gallium arsenide, but uh, it's still, still very high. And uh, so how do we get the, the lateral electric field? Well, you apply a voltage between, between the source and the drain. Lastly, we see the, the thermal conductivity is, is very similar to that of silicon, but the maximum working temperature is, is much higher. So you can, you can run these devices much hotter. And you don't require a ton of cooling for, for the gallium nitride devices. And a cooler device means a more reliable device, which is, uh, which is great. I should mention that um, a lot of a lot of the more recent devices are built on silicon carbide, which is better at getting the heat out of the, out of the device. So we looked at the material properties, but making a device out of gallium nitride is just great. So in all the figures of merit that matter, we talk about breakdown voltage, switching speed, the one over R on, F max, and we can talk about electron mobility, but, but uh, basically it's very, very respectable uh, because of this 2D electron gas. The, the gallium nitride device does, does very, very well. So briefly, I just want to talk about how these devices work. It's pretty fascinating, actually. There's a, a crystal structure that's formed between the gallium nitride and the algan. And within each of these crystal structures, we have uh, asymmetries within each crystal structure. And this leads to little voltages, uh, built-in voltages and electric fields within each material. We call this the polarization. And that happens both inside the algan and the GAN layer, okay? And the difference in polarization causes a, a big change in the electric field right at the interface between the two materials. Now, while aluminum nitride and gallium nitride, they may have very similar lattice constants, we, we try to make it so, they're not exactly the same. And so that leads to mechanical tension between the two, between the two surfaces. And that, that mechanical strain causes a polarization. Polarization means uh, a change in electric field in response to mechanical stress. So we have a change in, in the polarization, built-in polarization, plus the, the piezoelectric effect. And when you have a change in electric field at one interface, that leads to uh, a sheet charge right at that interface. And we call this, this sheet charge the 2D electron gas. And it's not really a gas. We, we say that it's a gas because it, there's very little scattering at the interface of, of the lattice. You, that's why the mobility is so high. And you can see here the, the conduction band falls below the Fermi level, and that's, that's defined to be the, uh, the, the region of the 2D electron gas. So this is much better than, than a MESFET. So with a MESFET, you would have a, a Schottky barrier, and, and then you, you modulate the channel underneath that, and you can, you can cause pinch off, but, but you're relying on, on the doping. As, and similarly with, with a CMOS device, you have this oxide layer, um, formed just below the gate. Uh, so the key here is that we get very, very high electron mobility, and we get it almost for free without any doping. It's just from the physics of the, of the device. So as I said before, these, these devices are built for very high mobility, which makes them very well suited for RF applications, and then also very high breakdown voltage, which makes them well suited for power electronics applications as well. And so numerous uh, device processing tricks have been employed to uh, improve the usability of these devices in each of those two domains. 
So for, for RF devices, uh, they're built on silicon carbide substrate to keep the, the loss low and the device relatively cool. Uh, and there are efforts underway to, to have these built on silicon substrate. And today, uh, Corvo uh, can, can make an eight inch wafer, uh, eight inch diameter wafer today. And, and probably that's, that's old information, maybe by now they're, they're even bigger. So in the, in the power electronics field, you remember, remember this 2D electron gas, and we got it for free, even without the application of any charge. Well, that means that these devices are normally on. And for power electronics applications, that presents a safety problem. So as a result, lots of companies are trying to figure out, well, how do we make a normally off device? And in this, in this world, I would say the Panasonic is the, the pioneer in creating a normally off device. So then the other aspect is, the, uh, is these field plates. So for, for higher power, you, you want a higher breakdown voltage. And so what we do is we, we put more space between the gate and the drain. You can, you can lower the peak electric field between this, this access region with the use of a field plate. And uh, that, that tends to increase the breakdown voltage. But usually it comes at a cost in terms of the, the capacitance. So there's, you know, for switching speed. Okay, next I'll talk about the, the GAN models that we have available today, but I'll specifically not include two models because those will be uh, covered in much more detail by, by Ujwal and, uh, and Dr. Chauhan. So, so what, are, what are the elements of any model that you should consider? Right. So they need to account for numerous effects. So we can talk about field plates, substrate loss, short, so substrate loss, short channel effects, mobility degradation, et cetera. Right. And uh, we also need to deal with the field plates. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, and the trapping effects for RF applications. So one of the more challenging areas to model are the gaps between the, the gate and the drain region here. These are shown as the, the access regions, right? And, and we can model these using additional transistors in series with the intrinsic transistor, or in the case of the ASM hemp model, as, as a variable resistor uh, in series with the main transistor. And so we'll, we'll be, you'll be seeing how, how we capture this, this effect later. So another huge challenge of modeling these devices <clears throat> is, uh, let, let's just say we bias a device as a class A amplifier, right? So as you increase the input power, the average current is likely to go up in a linear fashion. This is what we show here. But in fact, that doesn't happen. So what we see here is the measured data shown in blue, it actually sinks downward and then it comes back up again. It almost looks like the device is biased in class AB operation. Right. And so what, what is the explanation for this, this current slump? The, the, the answer is, and is, is current collapse. So that's, that's common, commonly understood to be caused by these trap, trapped electrons. And they could be either in, on the surface between the gate and the drain or deep in the, in the GAN structure. And the evidence of this behavior is not obvious from the S parameters. Uh, it, so it requires either pulsed measurements or large signal uh, characterizations to, to highlight and, and expose these, these phenomena. So here we're showing pulsed IV measurements, right? So in these measurements, we sit at a quiescent bias and then we very quickly pulse up to some target voltage and current and then we go back to the quiescent bias, right? So in this case, it's negative two for the gate and four volts for the drain. So the question is, what happens if we change the quiescent bias point? Let's, let's see. What happens is, let's say we went to 0 0.8 and six volts here. All of the current, all of the current curves have changed and we call this, uh, this effect the knee walkout, right? And for every quiescent bias point, that's gonna lead to a different set of IV curves. 
So now you have this infinity of, of IV curves, and now how do we capture all of that behavior? That's, that's another significant challenge. Now, we can talk about what's happening here. Uh, Olivier Jardel pioneered some research, and uh, I know Tony Parker has been working in this space as well, who's in the audience. So when, when we are quickly capturing charge, when we increase the drain voltage, or when we drop the gate voltage, we call this phenomenon fast capture. And then we slowly release that trapped electron called slow emission. Uh, when we when we drop VDS or when we increase VGS, right? So the the RF manifestation is is a change in the power added efficiency or the output power of the of the PA. And this is one of the biggest challenges in in RF modeling. Okay, so this this may not be a chronological history per se, but this this shows and I'm sorry it's a little bit hard to read. This shows the available GAN models. And I color coded them in three colors, right? So we have light green, we have yellow, and we have uh, tan color. So light green refers to what I consider empirical based models. The EE hemp is an empirical based model. It, it was derived originally from the Curtis model. And uh, early adopters of gallium nitride would adopt the EE hemp model and then create their own derivatives. Corvo is one example, right? So they have their e, the derivative, some modified version of the EE hemp model. And similarly, when the Angelov GAN model took hold, and we call it the Chalmers model, then they started creating their derivatives as well, right? So we have the Angelov GAN and the Chalmers derivative. We have the EE hemp derivative, and then. In, uh, in 2018, then two new physics-based models were introduced and accepted as industry standard after a fierce contest between eight, a total of eight models that were submitted to the CMC. And so we're going to be learning a lot more about those models coming up. But I want to highlight one, one here. The Dynafet model is, is, a, is it kind of in its own category because it's a database model. It uses an artificial neural network to train the neurons, and, and, it, and it has tremendous accuracy uh, in, in capturing both the self-heating effects and the trapping effects. So anyway, the, the, main, the main point of this talk will be the MVSG and the ASN hemp and their applications. So here we show a table of the different models, in empirical, physics-based, and ANN-based. Now the question is, well, which model is right for you? Doesn't matter. I mean, ICCAP and eight Agilent, oh, sorry, Keysight, we support them all, right? So if you don't have process and device geometry information, we would recommend the Angelov GAN model because it's relatively easy to extract, and uh, you know you'll get some pretty good, useful models, right? As Box famously said, all models are inaccurate. Some of them are useful, right? So, but if you do have process information, then a physics-based model will yield better accuracy under large signal conditions because there's no way you're going to be able to measure and characterize the device over all the possible conditions. And the, the thinking is that with, with a physics-based approach, you will be able, you'll have a better shot at reaching those regions that you're not able to characterize. Um, and so, so yeah, and here's another huge benefit. Let's, let's say you're a foundry and you're trying to get into GAN and you want to know what's the effect of a lower contact resistance or, or um, increased mobility. The empirical based model is not going to tell you that. You, you would have to re-extract an entire set of model parameters. On the other hand, with the physics based model, you would have, a, because it's based on the physics of the device, you, you would have a pretty good chance of saying, okay, well, as I ch lower the contact resistance, my curves are gonna shift up more vertically, you're gonna have less uh, loss, right? In, and that'll lead to higher efficiency, for example. Lastly, the Dynafet, um, when you see the fitting results, it's probably the, one of the most accurate models in the world, and the extraction procedure seems fairly straightforward. It does require 
some advanced measurements which, uh, which, which we can help you with. Okay, so I want to briefly talk about the Angelov GAN and the Dynafet models. So the Angelov GAN model, as we said, is at its core an empirical model, right? It's about finding the best equation to fit the data. And over the years, this model has become the workhorse of the, the GAN industry. Uh, it's, been, it's been updated to include better drive, uh, drive gate, gate diode current and trapping. However, it's derived from small signal parameters. And sometimes you'll get two devices, uh, you'll get two sets of model parameters that show the same, I have to be careful, that show the same uh, characteristics, but the, the model parameters might be different, right? And so one, one common workaround for the limitations in large signal predictive capability is to adapt the model for a targeted bias point. And, and I think that we're moving forward, we're going to require models that, that are agnostic to your choice of, of bias point. So the Dynafet is a measurement-based model, and it works with advanced design systems. Zhangzhen Shu, or in China they say Shu Zhangzhen, he collaborated with uh, David Root to, to come up with this model. And as they looked around, they said, you know, every time we come up with a new model, we have to figure out the extraction procedure. This is so painful. And they, none of these models really uh, explain the self-heating effects or the trapping effects. So that was the main focus of the Dynafet model. And, and it's probably the, one of the most accurate models in the world. So at the heart of this model, it uses an artificial neural network. And uh, what, what are they? It's basically a framework of machine learning algorithms loosely based on how the brain works to approximate any nonlinear function in terms of a series of interconnected neurons. Uh, what th these are basically inter interconnected node processing functions. So we use a machine learning training algorithm to define the weights in between these neurons and then that becomes the model. So the model parameters is really the weights. So to provide inputs, it requires a rich set of data, and I mean rich. So at every bias point, at numerous input powers, at numerous load impedances, both magnitude and phase, and different ambient temperatures, we would incite an input signal at, say, 100 megahertz, and then 20 harmonics thereof we would be measuring up to, say, 2 gigahertz. Right. So this leads to a lot of data because you're varying input power, gate bias, temperature control, drain bias, et cetera. And then you also have active load pull for every one of those. So it's, it's a little heavy on the data side. But the point here is that let's say you capture all those harmonics. You can, you can convert those into time domain representations. And, and the time domain would show you the dynamic load line, which would exercise the device in a space that would not normally be possible uh, from conventional curve tracer measurements. The other thing is you're exercising the device. So we know that trapping effects have a hysteretic effect. If you, if you go one way versus the other way, so with, with, these, with these curves, you're able to exercise in, in, in all directions. And so the combination of the NVNA, NVNA data with the artificial neural network, uh, it accurately models all aspects of the device. So you can see here we have transducer power gain deep into compression, fundamental power and harmonics are well captured, drain bias current, et cetera. And uh, yeah, it, 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 works, it works pretty good. Okay, so next we're gonna, um, I'm gonna switch off and we'll have Dr. Radhakrishna talk about the MVSG model. Oh, please. I'll just briefly pause for questions. Is there any questions on, on what my content? And then we can also pause for questions after which will as well. So we have to remove the power when we are taking the IP card. 
Okay, so just to repeat the question, um, here you can see that the DCIV has a limitation on power oh. dissipation, right? And so how would the large signal data give us uh, something different? The, I think the answer is no, that... I said, how do you get large signal data? Because this car, we cannot extend to the right. Yeah. So whatever don't do, we cannot measure. Measurement will be like something like this. So, but, but you see how here, this, this goes deep into the region where, where you would not normally be able to measure. You see this region here? Yeah. And so you're able to get away with that because it's in the large signal condition. So it's not sitting there for a DCIV static condition and it's not gonna blow the device up. Although, to, to be told, you, you have to be, there, there is a little bit of an art to setting up the, the load impedances so that they do not break up. But, uh, but the idea is that because it's just briefly excursing into the high I and V region, yeah. uh, that keeps your device so safer. When you, when, you, when you collect the, the powers, the, the fundamental frequency and the 20 harmonics, magnitude and phase, you can convert those uh, frequency components into time series data. And so then the time series would give you uh, voltage and current in the region that you would not normally be able to access with a curve tracer. Oh, okay. From, from higher harmonics, you would get some difference. Yeah. Okay, yes? So the question was, what do you mean by dynamically? Did I understand? Right, so when we talk about dynamically, what we mean is the, it's, it's being used with, with that input tone and we capture all the harmonics with, with a active load pull at the output. And so given that, you're able, it, the, the waveform looks vastly different based on the, on the impedance that you present at the output. And, and that's what leads to, to these funny looking curves. And when we say dynamically, it's because it's a transient waveform. But you can, all of these transient waveforms, IDS and VDS at any moment in time will give you one, one data point at that instant, but it's the whole time record that gets used to populate the trapping state variables and, uh, and the self-heating uh, variables, which are shown here in the model. So here's the thermal model, here's the trapping model, and so those trap states will get activated for every single waveform. Thermal, how do you capture thermal information? Yeah, yeah let's, let's, take that, let's take this uh, offline if that's okay. Uh, I'll, uh, 
I'll, I'll share with you some papers that explain how the thermal uh, state is captured using the waveforms. And so, So, so the, the choice of the input signal frequency is mostly based on the trapping characteristics, the fast and slow emission. So you want to be faster than one time constant, but not one over the time constant of another one. And so you have to be in between those two time constants, right? Um, and indeed, I think your point is well taken, right? So if you want to go, get up into the 40 gigahertz, you know, you, you, should, you should submit an input signal that will, uh, that will do that. But once again, the, the details, uh, I'd have to put you in touch with uh, John John or we David Root. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great, great questions. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Raj, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. Uh, in the previous section of this talk, uh, we focused on some of the generic uh, compact models, particularly the empirical models and the Dynafet model. Uh, in this section of the talk, I'll focus on one of the two industry standard compact models that's available uh, in almost all the commercial simulators, including Agilent. Uh, this is the MVSG model, the MIT virtual source GANFET model. Um, it's a physics-based model. In other words, the terminal characteristics of the device, currents and charges and uh, trapping mechanisms are captured in a physical way uh, by describing how the electrons flow in the two deg in the device under the application of a particular drain, gate, uh, bias condition and at a particular temperature. So this model, uh, in this talk, I will focus not on the uh, details of the model equations, but more uh, the focus will be on how the model can be used as a workhorse for enabling circuit design based on uh, GAN uh, MMICs. So uh, Raj talked about how some of the material parameters of GAN uh, make it advantageous in, compared, uh, in comparison to silicon and other conventional technologies. Here I will show you how those material parameters impact the uh, metrics that are directly relevant to the RF and high voltage applications. So one of the key figure of merit that's particularly relevant for high voltage applications in GAN is this trade-off between the on resistance of a GAN switch versus its breakdown voltage. And because of the high carrier mobility and the high sheet charge density that uh, Raj talked about, uh, GAN offers a much lower on resistance for a given breakdown voltage or a much larger breakdown voltage for a given on resistance. So this translates to GAN switches being much more smaller in form factor for a given voltage rating. The second key figure of merit is the switching losses. So unlike silicon devices which have junctions that are associated with their own junction based charges, depletion charges, GAN devices are intrinsically insulating devices with a two deck. So this means that the junction charges are low and therefore the switching losses associated with the lower capacitances in these devices results in much better efficiencies. 
The third figure of merit is again related to this high carrier mobility and high electric field and that's the uh, trade off between the maximum frequency of operation where you can operate the device for a given power gain versus the off state breakdown voltage and GAN devices can offer hundreds of gigahertz with a breakdown voltage of hundreds of volts. So this naturally favors GAN in applications where high power high voltage uh, requirements are critical and uh, GAN based RF MMICs are already present uh, in the market. So to design uh, GAN MMICs, high performance MMICs that can take the full advantage of this material system and this device technology, we need accurate physical descriptions of how the device behaves in a circuit application. So in this talk, I will focus on how the MVSG model can accomplish this task. Uh, to do this, let's briefly look at the uh, a generic overview of what it takes to take a new material system such as this ALGAN-GAN heterostructure and to design circuits based out of this new technology. So the first step in any new uh, material system evaluation is technology CAD or TCAD where you uh, do finite element method analysis to understand how the carrier transport happens in these material system. Based on the TCAD, you develop some empirical models where the currents and charges which are the terminal descriptions are expressed as a function of voltage, temperature and frequency of operation of the device. Based on the TCAD and these analytical physical models, you can then come up with an optimized device design. In terms of GAN, it includes the geometry scale of the device, what is the source drain distance, what are the access regions that need to be present how many field plates and what configuration of field plates are necessary for a given voltage of operation. So those are some of the design parameters. So once you use these two knobs to come up with an optimized device design, we can then fabricate the device and then extract the uh, model that we have uh, formulated based out of the measurements. So we measure the characteristics and extract the model parameters and then we have an optimized device along with a calibrated model set. And this is done in an iterative fashion until we have uh, our uh, optimum design finalized. And then we can use this for the circuit design. So in this talk, I will focus on the MVSG model on how it can enable the design of an optimized device for a targeted RF application, which I will explain later, along with how the model can be used as a workhorse for uh, physical MMIC uh, designs targeting a particular RF application. So just a brief overview of the model. Uh, as Raj mentioned, this is one of the two industry standard models, which means that uh, the Compact Model Coalition, which is the industry consortium that maintains standard models for uh, several technologies over the years, from starting from CMOS all the way to GAN HEMS, uh, opened an, a, a competition for uh, GAN technology, uh, which was in four phase, which was held in four phases. Uh, there were eight candidates to begin with and uh, two of us uh, uh, qualified in the fourth phase and we uh, are now uh, adopted as standards. So this included rigorous uh, evaluation of the model by our industry sponsors for the MVSG model these were uh, uh, the sponsors were ADI, TI and Toshiba and they were uh, the, the models were characterized against industry data Toshiba, Corvo and other uh, industry members of the CMC provided this data. And then based on their evaluation and feedback, uh, we improved the model and now uh, the model support is being provided under the CMC. So uh, this industry standard model has been verified against various uh, device technologies, various foundries have uh, used the model. But in this talk, I will focus on a particular technology uh, which was uh, based out of the wolf speed process, the Cree or wolf speed process. In order to design RF circuits, uh, MMIC is targeting uh, IEEE 802.11p standard, which is 6 gigahertz kind of an application. So in this talk, I will show you how this MVSG model, which is a physics based compact model, can be used to design such RF MMICs and show you how the model uh, fares in terms of the circuit level simulations. And then on the other hand, how the model can interface on the device design stage. So the advantage of physical models is that they are based out of actual technology parameters like geometry parameters, carrier mobility, uh, velocity saturation uh, mechanisms and so on. So they can give you guidelines on how the device geometry and process parameters can be changed in order for them to give a particular performance that is required by the circuit uh, 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 for a given application. So I will show you both these in this talk. 
So the target application for uh, the circuits that I'm going to show you is uh, what is called uh, uh, IEEE 802.11p standard protocol. This was uh, 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 opened up by the DOT for uh, vehicle to vehicle application. So the idea here is Wi-Fi has a range of 10 meters and if we can use uh, the same band for communication between cars, uh, we, uh, we need to extend the range uh, to about 200 meters and therefore GAN becomes attractive because uh, gallium nitride can offer much larger power densities at higher frequencies that in increases the range of communication. So this uses the 5.85 to 5.925 gigahertz band and the target spec is to be able to deliver power to be uh, received at a range of 300 meters. So the target power for the PA is much larger, about uh, 28 dBm. So this was uh, prototyped uh, in the University of Michigan where they put this system in the trunk of a car, but you can see clearly uh, the size of this uh, subsystem is quite large. So it occupies a large amount of your trunk space. So the idea is then can we replace this and shrink the size of this uh, solution and uh, embed this within a cell phone. So if you look at the RF front end system in a typical iPhone, uh, a large amount of the form factor of the electronics is consumed by the RF front end. And the idea is if we can uh, replace the conventional technologies with uh, 3 phi GAN, then we can increase the power density with a much smaller form factor and also improve the efficiency. So your battery would not die soon uh, for this extended range of communication. So this is where the gallium nitride uh, device uh, came into uh, evaluation and we used the MVSG model to design and implement this uh, circuit and system using the GAN platform uh, in Cree, formerly Cree, now Wolf Speed. So as Raj mentioned, this device itself uh, comes in two flavors. There is the uh, RF version of the device and then there is the high voltage version of the device. Now there are certain ca similar features in both these uh, versions of the device. There is the gated region which modulates the 2DEG and uh, ensures the device is on or off. And then there are these ungated regions which are called the access regions which uh, determine how the device behaves under high current, high voltage operation. So these are the regions that impact the linearity performance of the device as I will show later. Now the key difference between the two flavors of the device is in the scale of geometry. The RF devices are typically a few hundred nanometers in gate length whereas the high voltage devices are a few microns in gate length to support the large breakdown voltage. They also have multiple field plates uh, in order to support the off-state breakdown voltage. Now in the MVSG approach, we follow a sub-circuit kind of a topology. So we model each of these regions in the device in the form of a transistor. So we have the gated transistor, we have the access regions modeled as implicit gated transistors. So there is no actual gate but uh, implicit gate which controls how the 2 deg uh, the carriers move under the influence of a large VDS uh, and they be, uh, impact the nonlinear behavior of the device. Each of these regions in the device are characterized by the same physics of carrier transport. That is the drift diffusion transport at longer gate lengths for high voltage devices and quasi ballistic velocity saturated dominated transport for RF devices and the model captures the scaling of gate length as we go from an RF device uh, to a high voltage device or vice versa. So the mo core model equations for each of these transistors is the same but the parameters that go with it uh, for example the length of these regions are input and they are different for each of these uh, sub circuit elements. Without going into too much details about the core model equation itself, I would like to tell you that the MVS approach uh, came up with silicon first. Uh, this was developed for silicon highly scaled gate length devices where if you uh, scale the channel length a lot, then the carriers that are injected at the source, uh, if you look at the uh, band diagram uh, in the channel, it peaks at the source and this is called the virtual source point. So this is the point where the carriers uh, are injected from the source with the uh, uh, thermal velocity at the ballistic limit. So if there is very minimal scattering in the channel, the carriers are injected with the thermal velocity and if you can compute the charge at this point and look at the thermal velocity of carriers at this point, you can compute the current in this device. So using this expression for the current which is a function of the charge and the velocity at this point, you can uh, 
compute the uh, charge from different operating regions in the device. So for example here if you look at the charge as a function of gate voltage, the model can capture both the below threshold condition as well as the above threshold condition, essentially cap modeling the on to off uh, region of operation. And if you look at the uh, linear to saturation region of operation, so at low VDS you are in the linear region and the model captures the linear dependency of the current through an FSAT function. And in the saturation region the device behaves like a current source and the current is uh, determined by this charge and the velocity and this FSAT function goes to 1. So in saturation you get the uh, saturation current which is the product of the charge and velocity at the virtual source. We then extended this to the GAN device to incorporate all the GAN specific effects. In this the current is not just a function of the charge at the virtual source but it is also dependent on the charge on the drain side. So this is a symmetric formulation, uh, it is a charge dependent formulation for the current which expresses the current as a function of the two charges, the saturation velocity and also a function that accounts for the uh, scaling of the gate length because we have an RF version and a high voltage version of the device. So the key points here is that the current is a charge based uh, uh, formulation in the MBSG model. And this is useful because it captures this trade off that exists in any compact model between accuracy and convergence well. So for accuracy the MVS approach captures the voltage, temperature and frequency dependence using a charge based formalism. It has symmetric uh, charge based formalism which aids in the convergence properties. So the nodal symmetry ensures that there are no bad discontinuous behavior in the device model. And it also minimizes the node count and favors the implementation in Verilog A. So we have ensured that the model is reasonably accurate to, uh, uh, through extensive calibration against a variety of device technologies. And we have also uh, shown how the model fares in circuit applications by actually using this for MMIC design and then verifying the measured uh, GAN data against uh, uh, the model simulations. And in terms of convergence we have shown that the model satisfies most of the standard convergence benchmark tests as I will show later. So the first step in the model calibration is to calibrate the model against DC terminal characteristics. So shown here is an RF device, a very short channel device, 40 nanometer uh, gate length and this means that the device suffers from significant short channel effects. As you can see from the output characteristics and the transfer characteristics, the model matches well with the measured data using physical set of parameters and you can capture the short channel effects like dibble and punch through which appears both in the output conductance and in the subthreshold region. If you look at the derivatives such as the output conductance and the GM, you can see that the GM also uh, degrades at higher gate voltages. That is because if you up increase the gate voltage the channel turns on, it becomes mostly conductive. But the access regions which are the ungated regions that I talked about, they limit the tra transport of current and they limit the maximum drive current that you can get out of this device. So that means that as you increase the VG, the current does not keep on increasing and the GM degrades and this is captured using this uh, implicit gated transistor approach. Once again. Uh, the model is calibrated against different gate length regimes as well. So this is a typical high voltage device with a longer gate length, 3 micron. Again the model fares well with the measured data but here uh, you can see the other modes of operation of this device from a DC standpoint. These are the output characteristics show, showing significant amount of self heating, the output conductance, the uh, transfer curves, again the degradation in the GM but also the third quadrant of operation where the VDS is negative and the VGS is increasing uh, showing the turn on of the FET in the third quadrant can also be captured and the GDS in the third quadrant is also shown. So once we extract the model uh, using physical set of parameters either offered from the foundry or through independent measurements like Hall measurements or TLM measurements, we can extract and fit the model in the forward mode and then it gives this kind of a match in the reverse mode. Once the DC parameters are extracted, we then move on to the uh, calibration against the uh, high frequency and RF characteristics. So the first step is to look at the quasi static CV data. So for this we look at the CV measurements using bias T's in the off state. If you look at the VD sweep of the device in the off state, the capacitance, the input output and the reverse transfer capacitances 
these show transitions in the CV at different voltages. So you can see here that there is a transition at around 50 volts and another transition at 100 volts. These are because of the field plates in this device. So one of the field plate, for example, the gate connected field plate has a VT of minus 50 volts. So this shows a transition in the CV because of the depletion of the field plated transistor at 50 volt. And then there is another transition happening because of the source connected field plate. So this enables us to deplete the different regions in the device as the drain voltage is increased, uniformly uh, making the electric field distribution more uniform and increasing the breakdown voltage in the device. So the model then uh, uh, can be calibrated against the CV data and then the device level parasitic components are embedded to the core model. So the transistor model that I talked about which is a large signal nonlinear model uh, which is physical is within this blue box here. The rest of the passive elements along with these resistors are due to the layout dependent uh, parasitics associated with the device. So they include the pad capacitances, the lead inductances, the contact resistances and the substrate loss network. This is the well known condo topology and once we use this we can then calibrate or extract these sub circuit elements against measured S parameters spanning the full frequency range of operation from low frequency all the way to FTF max of the device and the bias range covering the whole operation of the device, uh, the full VDS and the VGS range. The model is physical which means that once you extract the DC and the small signal CV, the core model is extracted. And then once you calibrate it against S parameters, the sub-circuit uh, parasitic elements are extracted. So then the model should be able to uh, estimate the large signal parameters for the full bias and frequency range. So these are some of the typical results that you get. This is a class AB power sweep, output power versus input power, efficiency versus input power and some source pool measurements where the source impedance is changed uh, on the Smith chart. As you can see once the model is calibrated up to this point it should be able to give you the match in terms of large signal independent of bias and frequency. So some of the finer details of the model uh, somebody asked about the thermal heating. So one of the way to extract the temperature dependent behavior of the device is to measure the IV data uh, at different substrate temperatures. So you uh, heat the chuck and measure the DC IV data. Uh, actually pulsed IV data at different temperature. So here you can see the model uh, measured again and calibrated against uh, both low temperature and high temperature. So from pulsed IV measurements where you can remove self heating significantly, these are steady state but pulsed IV measurements you can remove self heating so your RTH is 0 and then you can extract the temperature coefficients by looking at the temperature curves at different chuck temperature. So once you extract the temperature coefficients you can then use the steady state data to extract your RTH. So that is one way to extract the temperature coefficients with a couple of uh, uh, chuck temperature measurements and then uh, using a third temperature to validate that the extracted parameters are accurate. The last uh, final detail or uh, uh, aspect of the model is this charge trapping. Uh, Raj talked about the large signal charge trapping. To calibrate the model we use these pulsed IV measurements where we bias the device in a pulsed mode from off state where we uh, apply a large amount of VDS stress on the device. So in the off state the depletion region extends throughout the device but because of these charge states in the access regions when you turn the device on and reduce the VDS the depletion region persists. So the device under pulsing conditions offers a much larger on resistance than under a steady state on resistance uh, value. So this is shown here, uh, this is pulsed measurements with 50, 500 nanosecond uh, pulsing. This is a particularly bad device to highlight the impact of uh, trapping. The blue curve is the DC IV curve for the same VG data and the, sub, uh, the other colors correspond to the stress value starting from off state 0 volt VDS to 25 volt VDS in the off state. As the off state stress is increased you can see that the currents pick up very slowly and the on resistance degrades. So this is called the well known knee walkout because the knee point is shifting towards high voltage values. In the MVSG model we capture this using a diode RC uh, methodology that has a stress uh, drain to gate voltage stress that depends on the temperature, the drain to gate stress as well as uh, a few temperature coefficients. 
and we use a pulsing uh, measurement technique to measure the on resistance under switching conditions and compare it with the DC value. So we measure this knee voltage under DC and then also measure the knee voltage under switching conditions and we call this the V ratio. Now larger the V ratio compared to 1, the more is the degradation in the on resistance and the knee walkout effect. And you can see for this device uh, as the VDS stress is increased, the knee walkout happens at around 200 volts where this V ratio increases significantly beyond 1. And with the incorporation of this trapping module in the MVSG, we can capture this knee walkout effect as a function of frequency and bias and we also uh, elsewhere show that it is also temperature dependent. And so far the model con uh, accuracy aspect was shown and uh, here one of a small uh, demonstration of the convergence robustness is shown. So one of the standard tests to show the model is convergence robust, in other words it does not have bad derivative behavior is this uh, are these Gummel symmetry test where you uh, apply the uh, Vx from negative to positive and look at the current as well as its derivatives like the first derivative, second derivative, third derivative and so on. So ideally the models, compact models that are physical show infinitely uh, differentiable behavior. So all their successive derivatives especially at VDS of 0 where you are switching the device from forward to reverse mode, they show no discontinuous behavior and this model uh, shows that. So, so far I have shown you the capability of the model in terms of uh, extra, uh, modeling the device level characteristics accurately. Now I will move on to how the model can be used to design an RF circuit with this particular uh, front end circuit that I talked about. So this is a first fully integrated GAN RF front end designed for this uh, 802.11p standard 5.9 gigahertz application. It includes two modes, the transmitter mode and receiver mode uh, uh, using the same antenna port here. All the power amplifier FETs and the LNA FETs on the receiver mode are GAN devices in the Cree process and the switches are also GAN. All the passives are also on chip. So this is the circuit topology. On the PA side it has two uh, FETs, one in class AB, one in class C kind of an operation. All the impedance matching is on chip. The bias T's are uh, on chip as well and then there is the switches that uh, disconnect the PA from the LNA uh, and from the antenna port. So uh, using series and shunt switches uh, which are on chip and then the LNA uses a class AB FET uh, along with the impedance matching uh, on the input output side for uh, this 5.9 gigahertz uh, application. So this is the full form factor, it is a few millimeters by few fil uh, millimeters uh, and because of the high quality of the uh, on chip uh, inductors with a Q of around 10, you can get decent performance uh, and this is one of the smallest form factor for this application. We simulate and uh, design this device, uh, this circuit using the MVSG model for the PA and the LNA and for the PA side the saturated power from the PA is 28.8 dBm which matches the uh, target spec and the PAE is 50 percent because of the class AB plus C kind of an operation. So you can see the model gives you the time domain waveforms which you can then uh, show how the output IV curves uh, look like. The output drain voltage and drain current are uh, kind of out of phase and then uh, there is no active power dissipation as you can see which is a characteristic of class AB plus C. The peak uh, efficiency, the transducer gain, the saturated power and the RF current are all uh, estimated accurately. And then on the LNA side, the input output matching is significantly accurate. You can see that at 6 gigahertz, the input matching is pretty good. The noise figure using the thermal noises, uh, short noises model in the MVSG, you can capture the noise figure for the full frequency range. Uh, we could not measure the lower frequency but at 5.9 giga, 5 gigahertz the noise figure is around 3 dB. Also the OIP3, the large signal distortion on the output can also be modeled well and the OIP3 is around 22 dBm. So this way I have shown you one example of a practical application of such a physical model in RFMMIC design. The second uh, uh, focus of this talk is how can we use the model to then evaluate how the device behaves in a circuit and then improve the device itself. So for this we look at the linearity performance of this PA. So we all know that a PA is inherently nonlinear primarily because of the FET being nonlinear because the FET has these GM derivatives which means that if you have two channels that are very closely spaced 
because these channels uh, uh, at any particular frequency also have these uh, side bands, they cause spectral regrowth at the output and they cause interference of adjacent channel. Now, if you look at the device GM, the non-zero derivatives happen in a very orderly fashion. If you look at the second and the third derivatives, the non-zero content in these derivatives are a function of the operating class. So you can see this peak and the trough behavior in the GM derivatives and for different classes, you can potentially match the peak of one class of FET with the trough of another class of FET. So at the circuit level, you can combine differential classes to reduce the non-zero content and reduce the effective circuit level GM derivatives in the higher order modes. So we test this out at the circuit level. We have the two FETs. We can independently bias them. And then we bias them in the same mode, AB plus AB, and then in differential mode, AB plus C. So in one of the modes, the peak and the trough can be cancelled. The non-zero GM derivatives can be lowered. And if you look at the fundamental and the uh, third order intermodulation distortion, for the class AB plus C, for a similar fundamental performance, the IMD goes lower. Just to uh, highlight this point, you can see that the IMD at this P in range is much lower for the class AB plus C. And the model, just by calibrating against one of the FET, uh, by changing the class and running the simulation can give you this kind of a changed performance. The data points are circles and the solid lines are the model sims. Now this is good, but the disadvantage with this technique is that you have to differentially bias the two FETs, which means you need that many number of gate power supplies. So how can we avoid this? To dif uh, differentially bias the FET in a different class, you can change the VG or you can change the VT because what matters is the gate overdrive. So it's wh what matters is the VG minus VT. So we do this by looking at the device and looking at how we can change the VT in a device. We adopt a nano fin kind of a topology in the GAN hem. So instead of planar device, if we can etch the device the, along the width direction, Depending on the width of the device of this fin, the VT can be changed because of lateral depletion. So a narrower fin has a much higher VT than a wider fin device. So these are composite different width devices uh, with the total same effective width and you can see the VT shifting as a function of width. Now we use the MVSG model to uh, match this kind of a behavior of width dependent VT. And then we fabricate a composite device where along the width direction you have multiple nano fin elements with different widths which effectively give you a much smoother transition because of the different widths. And if you look at the GM behavior, the off to on transition is smoother, the non-zero GM derivatives are lower and if you look at the model sims and measured data for the large signal simulations, you can see that for the uh, same output power level, the uh, second, third order uh, power harmonic content is lowered and the IMD content is also lowered because of the lower non-zero uh, GM content in the composite device. So using this kind of a physics based composite model where you can say, okay, this geometry parameter has this much impact on the VT, we can then simulate the device performance and then optimize the device using the simulation platform and then fabricate this kind of a device to meet a target uh, circuit level spec like IMD. So hopefully in this talk I have been able to show you the two sides of the coin. One on the device side and how the MBSG model can be used as a workhorse for device design and on the other side as a workhorse for the RF MMIC circuit level design. So I would like to thank all uh, the collaborators and sponsors for the development of this model and Keysight for uh, inviting me for this talk. Thanks. Questions for Ujbal? Um, the validity of the model in terms of process parameter variation, uh, has this been uh, uh, validated? Yes, so uh, the way we have done it uh, with one of the commercial foundries is uh, we calibrated against their no nominal device and then they run Monte Carlo sims first. They have a Six Sigma variation in key model parameters being mobility, gate capacitance, sheet resistance and uh, saturation velocity. So they run these sims and then they uh, put on those sigmas on top of the model uh, in the netlist, model netlist and then they have evaluated against hardware data as well. Yeah, actually, uh, is it working? <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that as it is, of course, it's a physical model, it should catch the 
memory effect, which is the key of GAN. But from your uh, all description, it looks to me that you have, uh, in the model, you have put the uh, field plate. Field plate will reduce the tapping. Correct. So actually, when we'll be going, and you have demonstrated up to 6.9 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, but when we'll be going for 5G millimeter wave, 28 gigahertz, then we may not be able to use field plate because field plate will not work at that frequency. Correct. So in that case, without field plate, trapping will be much more. Right. So how accurate your model will be able to do that? So we, the, the highest frequency we have tested the model is 110 gigahertz in the large signal sense. Small signal, FTF max wise, uh, the 40 nanometer gate length device can go up to 300 gigahertz but small signal sense because though they obviously don't have the field plate and the voltage range, the breakdown voltage is all low. It's also indium, indium aluminum nitride, not just aluminum nitride for greater charge density. So small signal wise, we have tested up to 300 gigahertz. Large signal wise, we have tested up to 110 gigahertz. Now coming to your question of field plate, uh, the charge trapping module, uh, the RC time constant that it deals with, it has a source function that depends on the drain to gate field and that drain to gate field is the internal drain to internal gate field for each transistor. So if you have field plate, that internal drain to gate field is much lower for the same external drain voltage because the field plate blocks most of the uh, field, uh, most of the voltage. So the field dependency and its variation with field plates is captured in a physical way in that, uh, with that dependency. But if you don't have field plate, the same topology works, but you would have to extract the model parameters for your particular technology because one of the ch challenge here is the topology of the trapping may be the same. It's essentially a diode RC with a, uh, a source function that's dependent on the drain gate field with temperature coefficients, etc. But the parameters are vastly different because the nature of traps are different from one foundry to another. So it would have to be characterized for that particular device for that particular application. But if you can capture the time constant for uh, of the traps the dominant time constant with the particular RC combination in the model, it's fairly decent in terms of capturing the trapping at a particular frequency. It's like a pass band pass filter, essentially. So is it any device that you tested in high frequency, model has been tested high frequency? Without field plate? Without field plate. Uh, the highest frequency that we have gone, uh, 110 gigahertz in large signal, that had a source field plate. Okay. So because it required larger power even at that frequency. I mean at 110 gigahertz is very close to its FTF max. So it would be operated at lower uh, frequency, but the harmonics would still be there around that frequency. So but another question about that, uh, you mentioned that it will be DC based. So you'll do the DC measurement on IV. Then for RF, you have mentioned that uh, you need the CV and S parameter. So, for CV, as you mentioned, that uh, trans uh, transfer capacitance and input and output, but uh, do you need that capacitance to be the DC capacitance or it should be frequency dependent variation of those capacitance? Uh, so, so frequency dependence of the capacitance. So capacitance, the device level capacitance is quasi-static. Okay, and then there is some GM RF dispersion, but most of it is quasi-static. So your DC capacitance, or if you don't have DC capacitance, as Raj did for his extraction routine, S parameter derived capacitances at low frequency. You can use those to get your uh, effective capacitance values and then fit the core model data. But the frequency dependence comes from those parasitic elements, along with the trapping and the RC time constant of the heating. So those are the three dominant time constants. So that means you need the S parameter like input capacitor and output capacitor and trans capacitor and all those parameter to be uh, frequency dependent. Yes, that's what I showed in the S parameter data, right? You, okay. you can either fit to the S parameter or at low frequency you can take a slice, convert it into effective imaginary part of Y11 to get gate capacitance and then fit that. It's visually more easy to understand capacitance for me, so I do that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have uh, Dr. Chauhan to talk about the ASM model. Okay, so I will talk about the ASM GAN-HEMP model. 
uh, this is the team so Saurabh and me are leading this uh, these efforts uh, currently I have two students and Saurabh is starting his new group at USF and these are the past developers uh, to postdoc and students from from my group uh, this is website for ASM Hempt model so you can get lot of information publications details and uh, also the documentation and also link for downloading the code all of this is already available on this website so I encourage you to visit the website so this is the overview where I am talking about how the model has been built we first have the electrostatics where we have analytical solution of Schrodinger and Poisson equation so that really covers the physics of this GAN then from this we get the 2 dg charge uh, fermi level uh, surface potential once we have this we use it in the transport calculation so we have this drift diffusion model where we are using the surface potential based current and charge model and from that we can have iv and cv which we also include uh, like debel the excess region resistance as velocity saturation and then we add other higher order effects like noise trapping self heating field plate uh, and finally all of this is included we can do any kind of simulation when I say any kind means really any kind of simulations and it will work and it will be accurate so just to brief you what are the advantages of surface potential based model which is what ASM Hemt is built upon first we have the better model scalability so once we have fitted it for a particular technology now you can really play with different parameters like what will be the impact of changing source side access uh, length, drain side access length or even the length, width or number of fingers and all of that is captured in the model and you will get directly the feel of or the impact of these from the model. Then the temperature scalability, so once you have fitted it for temperature for a particular range, you can extend it even if you have not fitted, so that way you have really the scaling included in there device insight so this is related to I am again coming back to this you really have insight on the impact of these geometrical parameters and other things from the model a statistical in CMOS world it's very common to have the statistical uh, simulation and here since we are including this from the physics you really can see the impact what will be the change in the circuits uh, uh, behavior from delta L delta W or the mobility or even the uh, let's say the uh, insulator length uh, insulator, insulator uh, you know uh, depth all those are included in this once we have done good calibration with the technology you can play with all these parameters and get the feeling of uh, what will be the impact at the circuit level uh, charges and capacitances are coming from the surface potential and uh, you very well know the surface potential based model is considered a very physics based model capturing all the physics so we have a charges and capacitances automatically coming from the uh, you know the surface potential uh, less number of parameters since it's very physics based so we have a very easy parameter extraction uh, routine I will show you just a simple parameter extraction and if we are using a single expression for all the regions so there is no let's say sub threshold above threshold all these things or linear and saturation single equation covering all of these regions okay and the model symmetry and continuity which is very important for two regions one the symmetry or uh, we are talking about the harmonics behavior so let's say around vds equal to zero you are interested in fifth harmonic seventh harmonic this is coming from this model symmetry and differentiability the continuity is very important where again the differentiability comes into picture for convergence so that's already in the model so this is to give you a glimpse of how the model is built upon we have this surface potential based core drain current and capacitance model once we have this we add all the real device effects such as for example channel length modulation mobility degradation uh, gate current excess region resistance, self heating, drain induced barrier lowering, velocity saturation, noise flicker and thermal noise, uh, sub threshold slope degradation, trapping effects, field plate, temperature all these are then added on top of this core model. From this we have the complete model and then we can go ahead for the parameter restriction. So just to show you that self heating, so here we have this uh, self heating network where 
there is this is the power dissipation in the device which is fed through this RC network and this node voltage is the delta T or the change in temperature which is then fed back to the device temperature added in the device temperature and it is automatically solved by the spice and finally we have the mod, uh, uh, temperature which is the real temperature in the device for that power dissipation. Uh, this is, these are the, some of the core model parameters such as cutoff voltage, subthreshold slope factor, subthreshold uh, degradation uh, with the drain voltage and other parameters like mobility, thermal resistance, etc. This is just to show you the equation for drain current from using surface potential. So as you can see, this equation is valid in all regions, subthreshold, above threshold, linear saturation, uh, third quadrant, all of these are captured by the equation. Then the model parameter extraction routine, so you know it is again very easy, give the geometry information in the model, so length, width, number of finger, the uh, elegant thickness. Uh, from this then next we move to the next parameters which are extracted in the log IDVG region. I will show you some figures for this, uh, linear and saturation, extract the mobility, velocity saturation uh, parameters. Then we go on to the channel length modulation and also the velocity saturation parameters in the IDVD region, uh, temperature parameters, capacitance modeling, once all is done, actually model is done, assuming trapping also has been uh, captured and self-heating. Model is already implemented in Verilog A, you can download it from the website and it is already implemented in several uh, EDS simulators, ADS and other simulators. And we are using and all the results I am going to show the parameter extraction in ICCAP software. So this, these are, this is just to show you how it works. So you start here from the IDVG, then keep on extracting some of the parameters and then you finally reach to the IDVD where you can have a good match. So let me show you one by one. We start here, this major data is, uh, this, these are symbols. So let's say this is the major data and this is the major data here. Then first we extract the subthreshold region. This is the subthreshold region where we have these parameters like N factor, CDS, CD. We play with these parameters and then here you can easily see by using the sum of the parameters including the V of, we have excellent match, right? Now we go to this, this part which is, uh, uh, which is the linear region part. And we have these mobility parameters, so low field mobility and the mobility degradation. And then we are uh, capturing this part. So here we have, you know, good match. Here you can see this is what we are capturing. Next, we move to the IDVD couch here. So IDVD has these parameters which are velocity saturation, mobility degradation, and also the, you know, excess region. And I will also talk more about this a little later. So we play with these parameters. We know what is impact of velocity saturation? So if your model current is higher, increase the velocity saturation so that it, uh, the current comes down. And that's how you play with these and extract the parameters. Here I am showing you the self-heating impact. So here you can easily see the red is before we have used the self-heating uh, parameter. That means your current has positive slope and it is increasing and also it is more than the measured data. Then we uh, imp uh, we change this uh, self-heating parameter values RTH0 which is the thermal resistance. You can see that when you increase the current comes down and it is matching well with the measured data. So here you can directly relate all the parameters with the physics. You know what is the impact of self-heating, play with the RTH0 parameter, the current will come down and match with your measured data. So, let me just talk about like excess region resistance. This is just to uh, tell you how we are capturing it. So excess region resistance, if I say resistance we know is a linear resistor, right? So we have the, this relation where we have, you know, uh, we know how the Ohm's law works. In this case, this is a semiconductor resistance where the, if we increase the field across this region, uh, this resistance, there will be a time when the carrier's velocity will get saturated. So this is what happens in these devices since these are very, uh, you know, high power devices, high, uh, you know, high electric field. So at some point of time, this resistance will start increasing because of velocity saturation effect. And this is modeled through these equations. This is how we have 
what it is saying that the drain or source access resistance as you increase the drain current will increase from this equation and plotted here is the RDS versus drain current as the current is increasing it is linear uh, it is you know let us say not very much some in some region but as we are increasing the drain current at some point of time it is increasing sharply and that is the velocity saturation effect. So everything is related with the physics captured using this these physical equations not only just uh, uh, in terms of one geometry the it has geometrically scalable uh, model. So for example the impact of weight, impact of number of fingers etc all of this is captured impact of length of the axis region. So let us say we have fitted it with one geometry for one uh, axis region length. Now if you just want to play for a technology as if you are a technology developer play increase the length you very well know what will be go with the impact at in the RDS. So this is I am showing you some of the plots for model validation this is IDVD where you can see the uh, self heating because your current is coming down at a very high VG here you are seeing bunching this is exactly what we know in LDMOS quasi saturation effect where the excess region resistance is now dominating the current over the channel so that is why this bunching is there. This is the third quadrant plot where you are seeing uh, IDVD in the reverse side you can see the match here with the major data this is the GDS or output conductance the derivative and again you are seeing here uh, uh, GDS changes sign because of self heating effect. So here this is IDVD uh, this side uh, uh, and uh, GM so these blue are the GM curve where again you can directly relate it with the physics. So what you uh, here you are seeing that this first slope in GM is coming from the velocity saturation in the axis region. If you remove this you will see the difference here then this ne next degradation or change in slope is coming from the self heating. So it is not just on the IDVD we normally see the self heating effect in the IDVD where you have the current degradation but the impact you will see here because all are related okay and you can see from again technology angle that if you play with the self heating or if you play with the excess region length uh, what will be the impact in the GM. Then here this is the uh, validation with temperature so uh, we have the temperature parameters. Uh, we extract these for some of the uh, major data and then here I am showing here for example the normalized mobility versus temperature you, uh, with the major data on resistance versus uh, temperature you can see the match here and these are some more plots uh, 100 degrees Celsius IDVD uh, IDVG uh, minus 20 degrees C uh, IDVD and IDVG. So you can see the temperature scaling is well captured by the model all across the temperature all the way from negative to very uh, you know large temperatures. And this is just to show again arm resistance versus temperature and ID versus temperature for different drain voltages. So these are just the same things plotted uh, differently uh, and you can see with the major data. Uh, then the field plates uh, in GAN are very popular just to refresh the basics we have the drain voltage applied here across the drain to source this drain to source voltage when we see the field in this uh, device we will see that there are peaks somewhere those are the regions where we will have the breakdown right to lower uh, to increase the breakdown we need to lower these uh, peak fields and we these peak fields are lowered by using these field plates. So in the model we have these uh, transistors for each field plate which are denoting the impact of each field plate. So this RS and RD these are the excess region resistances and these this T1 is your main channel which is uh, this uh, main channel uh, GAN channel and this, this T2 is for the gate field plate T3 is for the source field plate. And we know that these field plates are going to have an impact on the capacitance behavior. So these are the capacitances, input capacitances, reverse and output. Uh, here you can see that there is here increase in or change in this uh, capacitance which is coming from the field plate, one of the field plate. So here there are if, I, uh, if you have seen the gate field plate and source field plate. 
source field plate thickness or, or this insulator thickness is very large. So the V off will be very, very low like minus 300 volt or so. So that one we are not seeing here, but this one is coming from the gate field plate and this is when the normal transistor switches on. So this is when the GAN channel or the main channel is switching on and that's why you have the increase in capacitance here. And then rest of these are all uh, uh, you know uh, giving the impact and along with the temperature uh, showing you the impact of field plate. Then current collapse is very famous in these devices. So we know when the devices are stressed, so this is the before stress, very nice IDVD curve. When the after the stress, you have you can see that uh, you have the degradation in R on. So uh, also known as uh, dynamic R on, uh, which again covers the uh, history of the device. So what was the history? So if there is a stress, it will be, uh, so it will show the impact. So this is the major, uh, this is how we uh, actually may do the measurements. We have here VDSQ and VGSQ. These are the quotient bias conditions. So this is, these are like the stress conditions. Then we have, we keep it for some time at that bias condition, bring it to the measurement condition and take it back again. And that's how we are actually measuring, so stressing, measuring, stressing, measuring, okay. And this is a, a qualitative plot showing the drain current versus transient time, you can easily see that if you let it stay there uh, in the sense release the stress, it will go back to the original condition. So just to refresh again, the pulse type we measurements for gate lag, we have this VDQ0 and VG is stressed to some deep off condition. So uh, there will be a strong field through this alkane layer, but we are not having any field through the buffer, so only surface traps are being activated. For drain lag, we have the significantly positive voltage VDQ and the VGQ is the deep off condition. So there is a strong field through the elgan layer as well as through the buffer. And both surface and uh, buffer traps are being activated. And then from these, we can easily see this, uh, you know, R1 degradation. So trapping is going to reduce the 2DG in the, uh, in the uh, you know, in the 2DG concentration and that will lead to the increase on state resistance. So we have model, so I am showing you here uh, the trap mod equal to 2. So this is covered by two uh, time constant circuits where one is showing the impact of the gate voltage or the uh, surface trap, the other one is capturing the buffer traps. This is how the measurement was done, same strategy we are using also in the simulation. So we have implemented this in IC cap the, on our own. Uh, and this, uh, you know, th th this was not available earlier how to capture. So uh, Saurav is also here who is the co-developer and we both have been working on this. So we, ca we put this strategy in IC cap and uh, we are extracting this IDVD from that, okay. And so this is how the model is built upon for the trapping. We have these, some of these trap parameters which are going to impact here you can see V off or eta parameter, CDS, CD, which is the sub-threshold sub uh, parameter. So this is, the, this, this trap, uh, uh, let's say this trap if impact is captured in these uh, change in the parameters. And finally, when you see here the drain current versus gate voltage, what you are seeing here that as uh, we are going from, let's say, a uh, uh, fresh condition, which is DC IDVG, to a more stressed condition, so we have here a uh, VDQ of 20 volt and 5 volt to two conditions for two different uh, current values. And then you can easily see the model is automatically capturing this thing, okay. So this is how we actually extract and model this thing. And once we have done this, uh, uh, you can also see the impact on IDVD. I will show you a little later. There are two other trap models also in ASM uh, other One is trap mod one where we have this to change the cutoff voltage, dibble and source uh, and train excess resistances. So this one is uh, uh, the function of VDS and also trap mod 3 where instead of separate VG and VD, uh, it includes the VGD uh, and then it is used to capture the, you know, excess uh, impact on excess region resistances, especially useful for the power device. So I was, I already showed you this where we have seen the impact of traps on the uh, IDVG. This is what we are seeing the IDVD. 
symbols are here measured data and the uh, lines are model you can see the are all increase and the knee walkout both are captured so this is the change in saturation current and are on all this is all uh, well captured in the from the trap model then going to the rf part so we very well know s parameters are most popular uh, way to measure the uh, you know high frequency behavior uh, we have we need dm embedding so we once we have the uh, measured data of the device uh, and also we need the open for example either open source or trl structure so uh, uh, we have before dm embedding we have the after dm embedding once we have the dm embedded data we we have the model so this is our core model which is there which is uh, covers all these capacitances uh, resistances etc and then we need the pad parasitics so these are gate manifold uh, drain manifold and source and the inductances and, and all these we have we need to extract so in terms of pad parasitics these are the passive part so all of this this is showing how the passive uh, part is uh, varying with the uh, resistance or passive behavior so in terms of rf model extraction uh, we de embed the manifolds extract the intrinsic core model using y parameters extract inductance inductance at high frequency so once we have the measured as parameters including the de embedding structures we can easily convert those to y parameters and easily get the lc gm gds and rg here it is important again that since the dc behavior is well captured including the pulsed part the extracted here these conductances etc will have very well match with the whatever has been measured in the dc and model will capture those so don't need to go through all the equations but just to say that y parameters have are made of these you know capacitances resistances and gm and gds so from these y parameters we can easily get these capacitances and gm and gds and all those will match with the dc measurement data also and the model will capture from both either the dc or from the s parameter so this is to show you again when you are talking about gm this is like a real y to 1 and similarly the imaginary parts are capacitances so these are the plots uh, versus frequency and here you are you can easily see these are being shown here up to 20 gigahertz and uh, so you can see the match and also the biases so all the biases there is really we are not talking about one bias point we are talking about the entire bias range being covered uh, from the model against the measurement data and here more validation so uh, real y11 imaginary y11 and here you are seeing that there are there are these resonant peaks which is coming from the you know interaction of these inductances with the capacitances and since model is physics based we have captured the intrinsic capacitances and other uh, parameters uh, inductances are tuned all this will be captured by the model okay and this is uh, these are the plots showing the s parameters uh, for 5 volt and also for the 20 volt then power amplifier we know that gain pae and this efficiency is very important so the we need this load to pull, uh, load pull data what i need to emphasize here that we don't need to build upon the model we whatever we have captured from the dc and pulsed iv and the s parameters model is ready to be used and it will capture the uh, load pull data but to validate this one we are going to uh, once we have the load pull data you can easily see here this is the ADA, a model uh, in ads so this is a, our model then you have these uh, you know parasitics which are there uh, and then once we have extracted it against the iv and the s parameters all of this is automatically captured in assuming that all the parasitics have been covered so this is the match with the load pull data and you can see the accuracy here uh, from the model not only one bias point but all the bias points that's what how the model is so we really don't need as such but it is for the validation where you see that how good the match is and this is again the validation on the harmonic balance so you can easily see the accuracy i mean all are overlapping with each other and this is the time domain uh, waveform being shown so here as i again said 
the DC allowed, let's say, put the IV in the small signal or S parameters. Once we have matched those things, the harmonic balance, the uh, load pull, or let's put anything, you transient simulation behavior, all of that is captured. We don't need anything extra. The model will predict all those accurately. You just need to run the simulation and you will have that. And I have not shown here the slides on uh, noise. The model already has flicker noise and thermal noise model. So the noise behavior is also captured well. So these are the publications. Uh, uh, if feel free to refer to these. And I think Raj will provide these slides. Uh, and these will be available. So uh, we have published a lot of papers on these, all this, what we have shown, and a lot more data validation. And these are the conference publications. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So questions for Dr. Chauhan? not to the model, but if you really want to say the limitation, it will be in the terahertz where skin effects, all those things are there. So no, no problem from the model. If you have the good measured data, if you can measure the data, there is no limitation in the model. Oh, by the way, try to copy the question. Try to repeat the question because it's not going to show up. Okay. The question was, is there any limitation on the frequency range, especially a higher frequency range? So answer is there is no limitation from the model itself. More, I think the limitation will be on the measurement side. So if you can have a good measured data, there is no limitation. So uh, have you tested the model up to what frequency have you tested? Uh, 60 gigahertz measured data already we have published and it's already available in the papers. Okay. okay. More measured data you have just give it to us and we claim that it will work. And another question is that uh, the model you have developed, you have mentioned that algan GAN base basically you have taken. So by chance if some process does not use algan GAN, maybe aluminum in indium nitride GAN. So in that case, how accurate will be your model? So you have, see when we have this, you have the, let's say, uh, dielectric permittivity and the thickness of the dielectric, that's it. So it is or there is no as such reason to stick to one thing. Actually, when you mentioned the scalability, hmm. I did not find there any parameter of dielectric. The parameter in scalability you have mentioned is that source axis, drain axis, yeah. get length, finger, but no parameter about that. No, semi so we have parameter. It's just that I, when we talk about the scalability, generally in one technology this is fixed, okay. right? The dielectric uh, thickness as well as the type of dielectric will be fixed. So I have not, I mean, put that because, you know, as a circuit designer, you will never play with the dielectric uh, okay. permittivity okay. or thickness. But it's it's possible, yes. not much yes. difference. Yes. And my next question is, that when you did the pulse measurement, it looks to me that you keep the drain voltage obviously high, quiescent uh, condition, I'm saying. You high something 25 or 20. And gate voltage quiescent, you have kept minus some mm -hmm. value. So I have seen that lots of people say that pulse measurement zero zero will be the better condition to start. Means I'm saying channel, channel on condition mm -hmm. is better than channel off condition. But, but in your will area, that be a stress condition? Yes, yeah, stress, but it's saying lots of people from experience says that that's the best condition to due to the memory effect to characterize the GAN. What's your comment about? Zero, uh, zero, quiescent okay. will be zero, zero. Zero means get it on. Mm -hmm. But uh, in your case, I've seen you have kept the drain high, yeah. but you have off the gate. Yeah, uh, uh, okay. I may, I may be sorry, you have answer? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I think if your uh, goal is to get large signal performance uh, uh, modeled well, then actually it's a uh, high drain below VG, I mean the off state high drain. That's the condition which will uh, force the device into uh, the trapped state, which the device will see in large signal RF simulations. So if you measure the IV in that quiescent condition, it's more representative of the IV plane which the device is going to see when it is going to have this large signal swing coming in. Because at large signal, VG will be swinging from well below cutoff to above, and VD will of course be high. So you will 
so it's it's better actually to 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 set your quiescent point to below cutoff and even higher if if possible than your VDQ uh, for the PA. Uh, come on. Yeah. What? Can you hear me? Um, I, I'm afraid we need to move on, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have very much time for the demo. So, if it's okay, let's let's take that offline. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, the, my I guess my final slide here. I'll try to go very quickly in the last uh, ten minutes is that these, these GAN technologies, the concluding, concluding slide, and then we'll move on to the demo. So the GAN technologies will grow in market share in the next five years. So this is important, right? It's challenging, as, as, we, as Kamal has shown, uh, but, but it's extremely important uh, for, for the companies to move quickly on, on new designs. And, and getting this wrong is easy to do, and it's, it's also costly, right? But, but we can help with both the model extraction flow and, and also the training. So, so my call to action here is let's, let's work together to enable better designs with better models. And so here are some links to help you get started with ICCAP uh, if you have never used ICCAP before. And I'm happy to report that we have worked, as you have noted, <laughs> with, with really the powerhouses in the modeling community. We have uh, Dr. Kondalwal here in the front row and Dr. Uh, Radha, uh, Ujwal Radha Krishna. And, and, and also now we're, we're starting to engage with uh, Dr. Chauhan as well uh, on, the, on the development of this new extraction flow, which will be available at the end of, end of June. And so these are ready as a part of our early access program, and you'll get to see a, a live demo very shortly. So that's the end of my slide presentation. Now I'm going to switch to the, uh, to the live demo. OK. So this is, this is the ICCAP window, and I want to show the, the, ultimately, this is the, the flow. OK, so what, is, what does it look like? And fundamentally, it looks like, like a, a table. And, and what we did is we organized the different uh, DUTs on the side here. We have CV modeling. We have DC modeling. And then uh, in the case where you have uh, non-rectangular data, we, we talk about DC modeling with L-sync. And then we have S-parameter modeling, right? And more, more DUTs for different bias conditions or measurement conditions can be considered. But uh, we talk about DUTs. And then within each DUT, we have setups. So here we have the IDVGS under a linear condition. And, and so there may be some initialization code. For example, you might want to turn off gate current modeling at the very beginning. But the point is, once you launch here, then, then the, the objective is fairly simple. Uh, you just need to choose which plots you want to include. And that's what uh, Yogesh was showing us. He was saying, look at this plot. Now affect these parameters. So the question is, what are the plots that you want? What data do you want to have impacted? or to, to, to be leveraged. And then the question is, what parameters do you want to use to tune based on that plot? 
So these are just two lines of code, hopefully not too bad, right? And when you launch this, then we open up a new UI, which is what I wanted to show you. And so this, this is a fairly simple one because it's just the IDVG curve. But uh, what you see here is the selected parameters, VTO and subthreshold slope for the MVSG model. And you can either tune, right? So the tune will allow for the sliders and we can very conveniently move the VTO as such, right? And for every one of these positions, we are sending a simulation to ADS, which, which has this model built in, right? And now also the subthreshold slope, right? So that would, now you can see this in action. Now let's say I've got it in a fairly bad state and I want to only use this region, then you can draw a rectangle here and hit R and say, okay, this is the region, these are the points that I wanna use for my optimization. And so I hit the optimize button and it will uh, dial back in those, those parameters. So now this step is complete, right? Maybe I do it one more time just for, for grins and I say, okay, done. Now I can move on to the next point, which would be the transfer curves, uh, you know, and, and so a different set of model parameters would then come into play as a result, right? So, so here we are looking at the VDS dependence on the, uh, on the subthreshold slope, right? And so, so we, can, we can use these, these parameters. So, so the question is, once again, which data do you want to use and then what parameters do you want to dial in based on this data? And what we have here is both for the MVSG model and for the ASM hemp model, we have a flow, an example flow that you can start from and hopefully stand on the shoulders of uh, for your particular device, right? So we don't know the details of your process, probably it's a secret, but the point is you can, you can start from this example and get running fairly quickly with a fairly accurate model, what I would consider state-of-the-art models, uh, fairly accurate model parameter extraction on state-of-the-art models. And, and now at this point, it's just a question of adjustments or tweaking to say, okay, do I wanna spend more time on the gate current versus drain voltage, for example? Or do I wanna spend more time on, on the trapping effects or you know what I mean? So, so anyway, that's, that's available and you guys should, you know, I think it's a, it's a message worth spreading and it's you know, available at, uh, as an as a, as a add-on package for ICCAP and that's being released in, at the end of June in this year. So this is the update one of the 2019 release of, uh, of ICCAP. So uh, I think that's the end of my demo and, and I guess that's the end of my presentation. So if you guys have any further questions, we're, we're okay and we have a little bit of time to, to, uh, to have a discussion. You know, maybe we can also just come up to the, to the front and talk or if you guys wanna make it a, a, a forum, that's fine too. Uh, you know, I'm open to, to either scenario. So yeah, thank you.